Hey, listen, we're going to jump into the word today. Um, we are in a two week mini series, a, a collections of talks, as my friend Pastor Rich would say. Uh, but uh, we are in a series called The Sauce. Everybody say, The Sauce. The sauce. Now listen, this is incredible. All week there are people sending pictures of sauce to me. Just like, I got just all different types of sauce. Somebody was out here buying sriracha aioli. I didn't even know they made it. I just thought it was at this one restaurant. Honestly, it made me feel not as special. I was like, oh, you can just get that at the store. Okay. Um, but uh, this week, the concept and idea behind this is um, many of us, there are things in our life that feel bland. Your marriage may feel bland, your relationships, your, uh, your bank account may feel bland. Hello, somebody. You like whatever it is. And um, there's really only one way to keep anything from being bland. And that's a good sauce. The problem is we out here eating a lot of dry chicken. You see what I'm saying? Everybody, <laughs> we are out here living our life without the very thing that makes a difference, without the only thing that brings flavor to your life, without the only thing that can change a situation. Today and for the rest of our life, we have to understand the power of prayer. Prayer, fasting, being in God's word. These are things that change everything. You can have any type of regular meal as they bring out a sauce and it can take that meal from regular degular to you out here acting like you had a five star restaurant. You're like, this is so good. And it's just a five dollar sauce. You hear what I'm saying? But sauce changes everything very clearly. Prayer changes everything. As a church, we do not do anything without prayer. This is not an for a lot. This is actually crazy. There are a lot of churches who prayer is like a side thing. Like, it's very much like, oh, don't wait. Hold on. We got to pray real quick. We was about to make the biggest decision of our life. Let's make sure we pray. For a lot of people, prayer is like a last resort. It's like, oh, we've done everything else. Now we can pray. We done talked to everybody. We done watched all the, I signed up for an online course. I've done, talked to my mentor, to my mama, to my daddy, to my granddad. Oh, yeah, maybe I should talk to the creator of the universe about this issue. Prayer is not our last resort. It is our first response. The moment something goes wrong, we pray. The moment we don't have wisdom, we pray. The moment there's something that we could make in our own decision, but you know what? Just in case there's a little bit of me in this and it's not God, let me pray about it. This is what the Bible says. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I'm telling you, you can pray about anything and everything. And there's no certain type of way to pray. We're going to bust that all up today in my sermon. But there, like some of you, you feel like you got to wear a certain type of outfit and you got to dress a certain way and talk a certain way and talk real deep like this. And God, I, I just want to uh, like th that's not that like God does hear that. Everybody hears that, in fact. But God also just hears, hey. No, because you think you got to address him in it. He hears your, hey, um. Because he knows, he knows the number of hairs on your head. You don't think he knows your thoughts? You don't think he knows that deep part of you that you have? God hears your prayers. I'm telling you, prayer changes everything. And you can pray about anything. And here's the beautiful part about prayer. And I literally, I think it's one of my last points. I'm just going to throw it up front. The reason prayer changes everything is because the goal of prayer is ultimately, this is going to mess with some of y'all, not to change your situation. Many of us think the goal of prayer is to change whatever it is I'm talking about. The goal of prayer and the, is not to change the situation. The ultimate goal is to change you. The, this is not a wish list of God just giving us things. Prayer changes everything because prayer changes you. It changes how you feel about a situation. That's why you can be in an argument with your spouse and say, hold on, I just need to pray. And your prayer is not, God, tell that little boy that if he don't, no, 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 no. Like, you can, here's the crazy thing. I've started prayers off like that. Like, God, if you don't tell her that I am, and the Holy Spirit be like, boy, if you don't, like, he'll hit. Prayer changes everything because prayer changes you. Prayer changes the way you see a situation. Prayer changes the way you love your enemies. Prayer changes everything because prayer changes you. This is not Santa Claus. 
This is not a wish list. This is an opportunity to commune with the creator of the universe. And when you get in his presence, when you realize that his presence is not relegated to a building, it's not relegated to a time of day, you can be anywhere at any time and call on the name of Jesus. And in that moment, everything changes. Prayer changes everything. Last week, we talked about uh, desserts in the desert. And um, man, there are so many of us so many times in my life where I've tried to bring my pleasure, the things that made me feel good, the things that brought me comfort into a season where God was trying to develop me. As we prepare as a church, we've mentioned it earlier in service, we're about to starting tomorrow. Everybody say tomorrow. tomorrow. We are going into 21 days of prayer and fasting. Listen, the reason we're cheering is because we know what this does in our life. This is not just some kind of uh, law and relegation that we have to do. We have seen this change things in us. It's changed our character. It's changed our families. And Jesus in Matthew 4, he goes into the desert to be developed. And when we go into a time of prayer and fasting, this is a time of development. It's a time where God wants to change things about your character, change things about your family, change things about your vision for the future. He wants to give you vision and ideas and wisdom and discernment and clarity and, and, and show you things about your children and show you things about your business. But you cannot bring your desserts into the desert. You can't have your bags packed full of all the stuff you like. And then be like, oh, yeah, God, also, if you have time, if you could give me some extra vision, that would be great. No, God says, you got to leave all of that. I was talking to Pastor Tommy uh, this morning, Pastor Tommy Todd, man of God, a.k.a. the captain. Just to clarify, in case you didn't know which Tommy I was talking about. I was talking to him. He said, Charles, we have to desert our desserts in the desert. We have to desert, we have to leave, we have to abandon, we have to put to the side all the things that bring us pleasure while we go into a season of development. So today we're going to build on that. Um, I'm telling you, this, this, is, uh, this one's been in me. I'm not going to lie. This one's been in me. This is the one I'm excited about. So I need you to turn in your Bibles uh, to Romans 7, Romans chapter 7. If you've got a real Bible, congratulations, you get a thousand points. What are these points good for? I don't know, but you got them. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, We're going to read Romans 7. I messed up my real Bible. This is like my favorite. I bought this Bible when I thought I was starting a church. Joke's on me. Uh, But I got this Bible, and and it broke, and then I got it fixed. And by fixed, I mean I taped it back together. So, haha, devil. Um, Okay. Anyways, Romans 7. I told y'all it's going to be a good one today. Romans 7. It's a leather jacket. 14. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. Okay. (laughs) So the trouble is not with the law. It's spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So it's not me who's doing the wrong. It is sin that lives in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. This is my sinful nature. This, listen to this crazy schizophrenic scripture. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I don't want to do what I want to do, I'm really the one doing the wrong. It is sin living in me. I have discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. The title of the sermon today, if you're taking notes, is Win the War Within. Win the War Within. 
I'm going to pray for us. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are so good. You're so gracious. You're so present. You're so kind. And uh, as we gather in this moment, we need you. (laughs) We need you to show up and make a difference, God, because we cannot change ourselves. Transformation is outside of our jurisdiction. If we could have done it, we would have done it by now. But we need something greater within us. We need a power that spoke stars into existence to come and control this war that is happening on the inside of us. God, we ask for your help. Speak today. We are listening. We love you. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Um, I've told you about them, but I have three little chickens, Uh, three chickens. I said that to somebody the other day, and it's like, when did you get chickens? I didn't know you guys had chickens. I didn't know y'all had space for chickens. Not actual chickens, human chickens. I have three babies, Arlo Phoenix, Luna Rose, and Jade October. We have trademarked those names. Don't steal them. They're copyrighted. Saints be out here trying to steal names. You know what I'm saying? It's happened before. Hallelujah. Anyways, but uh, those are our three babies. I love them so much. Uh, when I was praying for Arlo, um, I was praying for him in Abby's belly, and I would sit there and just randomly in the night, I'd just wake up and start praying for him. And it sounds very spiritual. It was kind of like I'd be having a dream, like, oh, I'm out of sleep. And then Abby's belly was just all up in my business. So I was like, well, might as well pray. Okay. Um, so I'd be praying, and I got these three words in my head, and I didn't understand it at the time, but those were just kind of the things I just prayed. From the time we found out we were having a baby, and now to having three children, this has kind of been the thing. It was uh, purity, power, and peace. These were just three words that came to my head, purity, power, and peace. And ever since, I just, I, that's always what I prayed. I prayed purity, I prayed power over peace, I played peace. And I didn't realize it, but... Um, That was my three children. I thought it was just over Arlo, but purity, power, and peace are my three children. Arlo is pure. He's like, oh, I just, Bubby, if you're watching, Daddy loves you so much. You're the best kid in the world. He's like just a little squish. Like, you just want to hold. He like wakes up and wants to rub his face on your face. It's just like, what are you talking about? Get out of here. I kiss him on the mouth like 38 times a day, and it doesn't matter. Like, right on the mouth, come here. Like, it's just, he's like, he wants to be held. You can rock him to sleep. He's like, Daddy, I love you. You're the best daddy in the world. Daddy, you're just like, it's it's amazing. So Arlo is purity. Luna Rose, my shawty, she is power. She is the power of God in an 18-month-old baby. She, you can't tell her nothing she don't want to hear. You hear what I'm saying? She is independent. She grown. She drives. She voted last year. You hear what I'm saying? She is a grown person. She doesn't play games. Luna, I love her. And, and this is the thing with kids. I actually learned this talking to uh, Pastor Jules and Mario at a church. You don't ever want to, like, um, name your kids too early, meaning, like, their characteristic traits. Like, Luna right now, if I called it too early, it'd be like, girl, you wild, you defiant, you don't listen to nobody, you don't. But what it is, it is a, is a conviction and a passion that's been giving from God. So right now, it's kind of like you just will hit anybody you don't like. You know what I'm saying? You can't do that. But if we can tame that thing, if we can steward that thing trust me luna's gonna do some damage but so arlo's purity luna is power and jdb we call her jdb around the house jdb jade she is peace she just we were literally with some family the other day and they said is that a real baby because i haven't heard it the whole time we've been here i said it is real baby it's just the peace of god in a baby hello you hear what i'm saying it's crazy luna i thought about this the other day um abby was carrying peace at the most unpeaceful time of my life and of our life. Literally, like, I was having panic attacks. Our marriage was going through. Like, it was the most, like, non-peace we had ever experienced in our life. And she was carrying Jay. When Jay was born, everything, like, it is just, you just, like, get around Jay. It's like, that baby, every people come up, like, she is so peaceful. She just, like, what is it? So, purity, power, and peace. Now, these are our three kids, and um, Arlo and Luna are now at the point where they're old enough to have, like, the most fun, and they're old enough to have, like, the most gangster fights. Like, it is, like, it's starting to pop off around the Metcalf house. You have purity, and you have power in, in one corner, coming in at 22 pounds thinking she's grown Luna Rose and in the other corner a pure hearted sweet young man named Arlo Phoenix 
Now, we're, we're navigating this. We're trying to be good parents, but sometimes it just gets out of control. I'm going to be honest with you. Luna just doesn't care. It's just that's all it is. She doesn't care. So Arlo will have the other day, he had a toy, and he's playing with his toy, and he just has a beautiful imagination, and he's like, Wah! like going around the house, and Luna decides, I want that toy. Like, she just decided that that was the toy she wanted. So she walks over and just yank. It just yanks it out of his hands. Now, this is not a new thing. This has been happening. And so we're trying to parent them through it again. I'm not trying to, like, talk down to anybody. So I'm like, uh, and so what we've told Arlo is anytime something pops off with your sister, come get mom and dad. You don't do anything. Honestly, she ain't going to listen to you. She may not listen to us. But let us try. <laughs> let us try to handle this. So... The thing happens, she rips it out of his hand, and it's the classic, like, we all know what's happening. Mom! Luna! Mommy, get Luna! She took my toy! And Arlo just comes, like, high-pitched, running back there. And uh, that's what usually goes on. This time, we hear the initial high-pitched mommy. Like, it's like, Mom! And then, so we're like, okay, I think we're in the bedroom. I don't know where, but we kind of make our way out to the living room where they're playing. And then it starts to turn a little bit. Arlo assumes this power stance. I don't know what he like, he literally like consciously like stood like this and then goes, He's, and he starts roaring at Luna like a full, as much as a two year old can roar like a lion. And he goes, Roar, I am so angry. Roar. And he's just full voice screaming at her. And I'm like, what is happening? I don't know. Like, so me and Abby are just kind of, and it's still going on. Like, he's just like, and Luna, she's a gangster. She just sucks her two fingers and she's literally just like, <laughs> like just staring at him. Nothing happens. But me and Abby are like, where did that come from? Like, what was, have you known this lion roar? Like, does anybody like, and so it, it cause it was so different than Arlo. Like he's normally like, ah, like, but there was something that day that he said, you know what, I am done with these games. <laughs> you will give me back my airplane. That little uh, roar, that little lion came out of Arlo. And the truth is, um, we've all got a little lion in us. We've all got that thing that at some point, if you push me past a certain point, I will lose it on you. I will cut you. I will hit you. I'll talk about your mama. I'll cut you off and trap. We all have that thing in us that will go against our natural character. That'll go against your natural demeanor. That people will be like, what was that? Was Who was that? That didn't even seem like you. And that doesn't happen to you, D, where you just like, you go and then you black out. It's just like, you just gone. And you come back like, what's happened? What would we do? What like... But there's, it's like there's this other thing on the inside of you that against your natural desire, against what you would want to do outside of what people would know you for, there's still something that seems to rise up on the inside of you with this fight, with this, I, nobody can tell me what to do or you're not going to take something from me or you're not going to. We have all have this, this lion that lives on the inside of us. And the tension and progression of life is... Um, the growth of being motivated by this lion to hopefully being motivated by love. Because the emotion of this lion is unpredictable. Sometimes it makes sense why you lose it. Sometimes it makes sense why you flip out. Sometimes it makes sense what you're fighting. Then other times you mad and you don't know why. You fighting stuff, you fighting people, you fighting people who love you. Sometimes Luna, she just be like, ah, and I'm like, baby, I'm here for you. You don't have to fight me, baby. I'm on your side. Like, but there's just something on the inside of all of us that we sometimes feel like, where did that come from? That's not even me. Have you ever had that thought? That wasn't even, why did I do that? I would never. We all have something on the inside of us that pushed to a certain point. We do things we swear we'd never do. We say things that we, in our right mind, we, we swore we'd never say that. We swore we'd never go sleep with them again, but something, there was something on the inside of us, almost as if you weren't in control, that's, that you couldn't control. You didn't want to do it. You didn't want to say it. You didn't want to steal the money. You didn't want to talk about, you didn't want to do it, but it felt like, I just can't even, I got, I got to let it out. Wow. You see, this is the war within all of us. This is not just some uh, natural thing. We're like, oh, yeah, sometimes I say things that I probably shouldn't say or sometimes I do things maybe I shouldn't do. No, there is a war 
within you. The Bible's very clear. There are two forces. There are two powers at war on the inside of you. This is not just a good idea and a bad idea. It's not the little angel on one shoulder. And there is a war on the inside of every human being. This has always been the war. This has always been the tension. And we all find ourselves at a place in life trying to figure out as Paul does in this scripture, how do I win the war within me? One of the most powerful people to ever write scripture. I mean, this is the man who wrote two thirds of the New Testament. And he's talking about, I don't want to do it, but I just can't not do it. Like, it's like, I want to do the right thing and then I do the wrong thing. And he literally says, this is a principle of my life. Whenever I want to do what's right, I end up doing what's wrong. I need you to know it's not, um, that's not just random. You're not isolated in that experience. There is a war within you. Two natures, two beings that are at war for your soul. And this is not just any war. This is a fight. This is not just a fight. This is the fight for your life and for true freedom. Now, I want to clarify the word freedom because I say the word freedom, and if you live in the United States of America, you have a certain connotation, or if you live in another country, you have a certain connotation, but we think of freedom as I can do whatever I want, when I want. I'm free. I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, with who I want. I'm free. And um, this facade of freedom is something that the world sells but it does, not, um, it does not hold up when you actually do it. People say stuff like, I'm free. I can do whatever I want when I want. And to that, I would just say, um, you are free to do whatever you want until you're not. You, you can drink whatever you want until you don't have a choice anymore. And now you can do whatever you want until this perceived freedom actually becomes slavery. I drink whatever I want to drink. Really? Because it seems like you don't have a choice. It seems like you can't go to sleep without. It seems like you can't get on an airplane without making sure that you. So like you've done whatever you wanted, but somehow in your freedom, you're a slave. I can sleep with who I want to. Really? Because it feels like you don't have a choice. Like every night you can't physically go to sleep without. So you were free until you weren't. You were free to do whatever you wanted until you didn't have a choice anymore of where you went and what you said and how you talked to people and how you saw yourself. And this fake freedom is not the freedom that we are warring for. This is the freedom that the world tries to sell, that your flesh tries to sell, that don't let anybody tell you what to do. You can do whatever you want. You should be free. Don't let anybody talk to you in a certain type of way. But that freedom does not pan out. You, you are so free that you are a slave. You're so free that you don't have a choice anymore. You're so free that you were so free until you then you find yourself in a place where it's like, I can't I I don't even have a choice. I don't even want to do this anymore. I don't want to say these things anymore. I don't want to have to pay medication to go to sleep. I don't even want you were so free until you weren't. And that is the war within all of us for true freedom. And for this fake facade of freedom that the world tries to sell, you need to know that um, this war, this battle, it's between two natures. And today I kind of want to unwrap these for you today, because if you don't know um, the natures that are at war, you can't actually walk in the new life God has called you to. If you don't know what's happening behind the scenes, you're just saying, oh, that's not that big of a deal. Or that was weird that I said that. Or that was weird that I kind of like went crazy for a second there. But maybe I'll just try to will myself into doing better. Or maybe I'll just kind of work harder and make sure I do more. No, there is a battle and you need to be prepared. There are two natures um, that I kind of want to show you today um, in Scripture. It's so clearly outlined. The first nature um, is your sin nature. Your sin nature. This is in Scripture. It's what Galatians 5 says. The sinful nature wants to do evil. Now, this messes with a lot of people who think you can just be a good person. You're not actually, um, you're not a good person. That's because if we don't acknowledge that you put more faith in yourself than actually you are. This says your sinful nature, your natural bend and being wants to do evil, which is the opposite of what the spirit wants. 
So we have our sin nature and our spirit nature. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Listen to this. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. This is the war within. The war between your sin nature and your spirit nature. The war between pleasure and purpose. The war between what God said and what you know is true versus what feels good and what's going to make you um, be successful in the eyes of another person. This is the war within all of us. Whether you realize it or not, whether you accept it or not, you have been drafted into this war. You don't really get a choice. You were born into this earth. Congratulations. You are dealing with the war within. I want to outline a couple of things that to, to delineate these two because I want to make sure you're aware of what's happening. So um, your sin nature and your spirit nature, uh, both of them have kind of a status is kind of how I, I, I put it. There is kind of the positioning for those, both these natures. Um, the status of your sin nature is separated. It's separated from God. When I say status, I mean, where does it stand in position with God? Your sin nature is separated from God. Romans talks about this. It says the sin nature, it just wants to do bad. It is opposed to God. It's like your natural default isn't close to God. Your natural default isn't with God. It is separated from God. This happened as a result of the garden. But your spirit nature is submitted to God. It is surrendered to God. It has found this beautiful flow of trusting someone who's far bigger than you. It knows that, you know what, I have ideas, but this nature in me, it produces something in my life that I could never do by myself. So I willingly trust God. You ever felt that battle between those two? Between being separated from God to doing your own thing to feeling like, no, I just, I just want to trust him. I am submitted to God. So there's two, you have your first is your sin nature and your spirit nature. They're separated and submitted. The next part is, um, it's very clear they have different dependence. Like your sin nature has a dependence and your spirit nature has a dependence. Uh, the, the sin nature depends on self. That's just how it works. Look what I can do. Look at how I can do things. Look how smart I am. Look how good looking I am. Look at what I know. Look at the money I've made. Look at the cars I have. Look at the family I have. Look at my Instagram. It is centered and dependent on self. Your spirit nature is not dependent on self. It is dependent on the Savior. It realizes and understands that outside of God, I am nothing. Outside of his wisdom, outside of him, there is nothing I have that is my own. There is no talent that was I was able to use to make money that made me prideful that I had a bunch of money that God un doesn't understand. God gave you the talent in the first place. So without him giving it to you, you wouldn't have got the money to, to do the thing to act like you're in this position. It understands that I am completely dependent on the Savior. This is the war, the battle between self being your source, between self being the one that can bring peace, between self being the one that can find purpose by itself and find mission by itself and accomplish goals and, and, and do things, between self or trusting that maybe there's someone who knows more than you. Maybe there's someone who can accomplish more than you. This is the war within. The next part is um, both of these natures have fruit. And you, scripture says you can judge a tree by its fruit. So both of these natures, if you're operating in one of these, they both have things that they produce in your life. And this is a great way to identify which nature you're operating in, which one is warring against each other. Because they both have fruit. The sin nature's fruit is clearly outlined in Galatians. We're about to read it. But the sin nature's fruit is poison. It, it's perceived as pretty, it's perceived as attractive, but the fruit of this nature is not good. It, just, it, it produces nothing good for your home, it produces nothing good for your life, it produces nothing good for your future. The, the fruit of the sin nature is poison, but the fruit of the spirit nature, it brings purpose to your life. We all know the fruits of the spirit. Without those, what type of life are you living? 
Without those, how will you find the purpose of God? Without those, how will you walk how he's called you to walk? Without the fruits of the spirit, you can't have purpose. Look at how clearly Galatians 5 outlines. I read this in the message translation, and this was crazy. Look at this. Galatians 5, 19. It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. So it's saying, when you relied on yourself, when you're doing it by yourself, it's obvious what type of life happens. Listen to this. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. God better show me. Do something from. Ooh, okay. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition. All consuming yet never satisfied once. A brutal temple, a temper, an impotence to love or to be loved. Divided homes and divided lives. Small minded and lopsided pursuits. A vicious habit for deep. This one, yo, this one is insane. A vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Ain't nobody get me. Nobody understands me. Nobody's on my side. I'm by myself. Can't nobody take care of me out here. No, I don't need you. Fine. You left me cool. I don't need you anyways. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. This last one. Ugly parodies of community. That sounds like my Instagram feed. Just out here with my homies. We just went to. The, the sinful nature has clear fruit. Says so There's just stuff that like it looks good on the outside, but it produces something that just really has no weight. But the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. That like against these, there is no like this is it. This is the thing you're searching for. This is the thing that brings life to you. This is the thing that you want most. This is it. This is the war. But the war is between what you desire in the moment and what you desire most. The sinful nature always presents something you would desire in the moment. Something that would feel good in the moment. Something that you would like to do in the moment. But the tension, the war within is between what do I desire in this moment What do I desire most? Many of you, what you desire in the moment, yeah, you want to get in that relationship with that person. And you want to just kind of fill up the hurt and pain of your childhood with relationships, with money, with sex. That's what you desire in the moment. But what you desire most is a peace that surpasses understanding. And this is the war. This is why after you get out of their bed, you think, why? Why did I do that again? This is why you can get all the money in the world and it still not be enough. This is why you can date the prettiest girl in the world, be with that supermodel, and it still doesn't work out because they can't fulfill you. That nature, the fruit of it is poison. It's just, it doesn't work out. And this is the war that we're all in, is this, this battle on the inside of us that Paul speaks of. It says, I, I, what I don't want to do, I do. And what I do want to do, I can't do. And this, there's this battle between these two natures. You need to know both of these natures have fuel. They have something that's behind them, that feeds them, that pushes them forward. The sin nature is fueled by your flesh. It's fueled by your natural, flesh is defined as this, the human appetite and desire for pleasure. At all costs, I want to feel good. I want to be comfortable. I want to do what I want, when I want. Your sin nature, this battle that is spoken of in Romans and in Galatians 5, it is a battle between your flesh and your spirit. Your flesh fuels this fight. It fuels your pride. It fuels this, this, this sense of nobody understands me. It fuels it, but the spirit couldn't think of a better word, it's fueled by the Spirit. 
It's fueled by the spirit of the living God. It is fueled by the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It is fueled by the spirit that God said, it is good that I go because I am sending the Holy Spirit, the one who would guide you into all truth, the spirit of God, the comforter, the one that comes alongside of you, the paraclete, the spirit of God is the fuel. The question is, how do we win this war? I mean, people fight their whole life with this. You hear people struggling with addictions, with pain, with making money, then losing it all and still not finding peace. How do we win the war within? This war is not a new war. It's, it's, it's been around. This has always been the tension for humanity. It's always been between these two desires. If you look at ancient readings in theology and mythology of, of just different creatures and Greek gods, there was always this tension between good and evil, between right and wrong, between the good guy and the bad guy. There, this has always been the war. This is actually the exact war and battle that we see in Matthew 4. We don't think of Matthew 4 like this, but this is the ultimate war that has ever happened in Scripture. See, you ain't thought about what would the war consist of? Okay, the personification of the good guy and the personification of the bad guy. And the bad guy comes to attack the good guy. That sounds like a battle to me. Jesus is in the desert by himself, fasting for 40 days. And the devil comes to attack Jesus. This is war. This is Clash of the Titans. This is Avengers. This is, this is it. And many of us, we just glaze over the scripture like, oh man, that's weird. He's out in the desert. This is the personification of love and all things good being attacked by the personification of evil. If you want to talk about spiritual warfare, Matthew 4. It's so funny. We, this word spiritual warfare, it... Um, if you study the ancient language of scripture, these two words are actually never pieced together in scripture. I, it is a real thing. I want to be clear. Some of y'all is like heresy. No, just calm down. But, but the, our, when we say spiritual warfare, what we think of is not what's happening. Because we say we think of Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God to do what? What happens at the end of that scripture? It asks you to pray. It don't tell you go fight nobody. The scripture doesn't say put on this armor because... It's not that I'm saying this again. I'm just asking you questions. I'm not coming to change the Bible. I don't want to mess with that at all. I'm coming to say what you think of in warfare is not what's happening in Matthew 4. When we think warfare, we think of two equal forces that have tons of armies and battles and war. And we're trying to figure out who's going to win. The battle is it's very clear who wins. So warfare gives you this picture that the outcome isn't determined yet, that we don't know what's going to happen. And we don't know how we are. Vet. The Bible says that God took captivity to captive. He put death to death. The battle has already be won, been won. Let me be very clear about it. When you say warfare, this is not a battle of what's going to happen and we don't know and oh my gosh I'm being attacked and it's important you understand this because when you feel that war within you think oh gosh what am I gonna, I'm going to lose this war I'm going to win this war the, the, it's very clear in scripture we, this is not when we say warfare we think I wonder who's going to win that's not the position that Jesus is coming from in Matthew 4 he's not fighting the enemy wondering what's going to happen so when you step into spiritual warfare and you're thinking I don't know what's going on and I don't know how to you have to understand you're coming from a place of already knowing you win the reason that we don't are afraid when we go into the desert the reason we are afraid when we're fasting is because we're not trying to figure out who's going to win here's what the war is for Regular wars um, are to see like uh, who's going to be the governing official, who's going to win. There's war between nations that figure out, okay, this nation's going to overtake. Um, this war is not about um, a nation. This war, it's honestly what's happening is the enemy's trying to challenge your participation. So the outcome can be determined and he knows he can't defeat you. So he's just trying to get you to think, I just shouldn't fight. 
The war is not a matter of the enemy defeating you. He's just hoping if I can distract you enough, maybe you'll quit. Maybe you won't realize that your camp's already chilling and your king is already on the throne. Maybe if I can distract you enough, maybe I can, I can make your flesh feel strong enough, you'll just give up by yourself. You'll just quit. You'll just say, I shouldn't do this. I can't handle this. I wasn't born for this moment. I can't love my spouse. I don't know how I'm going to raise these kids. The enemy, if he cannot destroy you, he comes to distract you. That's what's happening in Matthew 4. But what's so interesting, if Matthew 4 is a war, if it's a battle, um, it's crazy because this war is not fought with bullets. It's not fought with yelling. It's not with tanks. This war is just, um, it was a temptation to eat bread. We think, we say, I'm being attacked by the devil. When Jesus was attacked by the devil... It was, hey, I know you're hungry. You want something to eat? Because we make spiritual warfare big things. We make it like I, the devil's attacking my body. The devil's attacking my business. That, all, that may be true, but when Jesus was attacked, it was just, hey, you hungry? I know you're hungry. You want something to eat? It was just, it was just the temptation of pleasure. It was just a little something that he wanted to give to that nature that said, hey, I know your flesh nature. I know your sin nature hungry. I, I know it. It's just how you work. It's just how humans work. You got to have food. So you hungry? Wow. Here's a little bread. This has always been the war. This has always been the temptation between pleasure, power, and pride. This is what the enemy comes to tempt you with in this war. He comes with, you hungry? Why don't you get some bread? That'll feel good. Hey, why don't you like, why don't you go up to the top and show us who you really are? Why don't you show us that you God? Why don't you do a pride? You know what? Matter of fact, I'll give you all of this power in the garden. She saw that the apple looked good. Pleasure. She saw the wisdom it would give her. This, this, this has always the enemy has no new tactics. And today, in 2021, one of the most, two, thank you. I don't know where I am. <laughs> this is the war. And I, I want to bring it to you that way today because if you don't understand the little things, then prayer and fasting don't make sense to you. Why would I do prayer and fasting? That ain't, that ain't even a big deal. When Jesus was fighting the devil, this, okay, this is so crazy. He wasn't yelling at him. He wasn't like, get the, like, double. he was just, it was temptation for food and him responding. He doesn't say anything that isn't listed in the book. He doesn't say his own opinion. He doesn't fight with how he feels. He doesn't fight with just a good quote. He doesn't fight. He fought the devil with scripture. And it's very important today when we're looking at the power of prayer, we look at the war within, we have to understand what's on the line here. It may not be a big attack of how you thought it was going to go and all these different things. It may just be a temptation to do what's pleasurable. A temptation of your pride, a temptation for power. That's what Jesus is experiencing here in Scripture. So the question comes, um, actually, I, I want to read this quote. This is such a powerful quote. It is um, Tara Lee Cobble. This is what she says. She actually described this war. Like this has been, um, this, like I said, this isn't a new war. This isn't a new battle. And she writes a poem to describe this battle within all of us. This is what she says. Two natures beat within my chest. One is foul, one is blessed. The one I love, the one I hate, the one I feed will dominate. If we're sitting here asking ourselves, how do we win the war? If we're asking ourselves, what am I going to do and how am I going to win and how am I going to... The truth is, the only way you win the war is you have to ask yourself and realize what 
nature am I feeding? Write this down. The nature you feel determines your future. It's very simple. The nature you feel, the nature you fuel, the nature you pour into, the one you give life to, it determines your future. Today, as we talk about the war within, um, I want to help you understand this. All of us have a choice every single day. You have a choice um, on what you will be led by. Your flesh or your spirit. Which one will you drink from? Which one will fuel you? We outlined it. The fuel to the sin nature is your flesh. And the fuel to your spirit is the spirit. But here's the thing. I want to break this down for you. When you are born, um, you're not born with both cups empty. We think I'm just born neutral. Anybody who has kids know that that's not true. You're not born neutral. When you are born, your flesh is filled up. This is why you are separated from God. This is why there is sin. This is why in the garden when man fell, sin entered the world. You are filled up. And your natural desire is to allow your flesh to be your fuel. Ah, Tastes good too. I'm a little tired. Now, we already know the fruit of the flesh. So it should not be surprising when this is your only option that the fruit of your life only looks like the flesh. Because we say things like this, I don't know why I can't stop drinking. I don't know why I can't stop lying to people. I don't know why when I get in a hard situation, I just cuss everybody out. I've been saved for 20 years. But you've only drank from the flesh cup. So it makes sense that the only thing you would experience, the only thing that comes out of you, the only thing you pour out is you don't have nothing to give. All you have is flesh. But then here's what happens. Um, Life Church is incredible, and they make the YouVersion Bible app, and you'd be like, hey, scripture of the day. Ah. Ooh, Lord. Y'all ready for 2022? God's about to move. <coughs> Woo! That spirit got a little something in it. <coughs> that was a real choke. That was not part of the illustration. <coughs> You drink that Holy Spirit fire, go down quick. Woo! <laughs> Trying to get it back. The only problem is um, you got enough to get you through that day, but now the cup's empty. And guess what? You're a human, and you're going to get thirsty again. So you only read your Bible once, and you're thirsty, and you think, I drank that yesterday, and so I got it. Before I leave, let me just, uh, Okay. Mm. Ah. That's, that's all you have to live on. Oh, you're working with this flesh. And then you think, oh, well, let me read another scripture of the day. Okay. All right. That was good. That was nice. Mm. Oh. Ah. Thank you, Lord. The only problem is this cup is still full and you are still a human. So whenever you get tired, whenever you get thirsty, you've only left yourself one option. You've only left yourself the option of I have to drink from what feels good. I have to drink from what makes me look better. I have to drink from other people thinking I'm somebody I'm not. The only option you've left yourself is to drink from the flesh. And then we're confused while we're not seeing God move in our life. We're confused when we don't have vision for the year. We're confused when we don't have wisdom to raise our children. The only thing you've drank from in 20 years is the flesh. You want to talk about winning the war. If you're going to win the war, you have to check which cup are you filling. Because here's the thing. Every single day, whatever you do either fills up your flesh or your spirit. That is the only option. There is no neutral. There is no, ah, oh, this isn't that bad. You listen to that song talking about who they sleeping with? Wow. 
I just like the beat. It don't matter if you like the beat. You filling this cup up and you thirsty. Well, no, it's not that big of a deal. You know, we just drink a little bit because it's fun. And yeah, we get a little... I, And then you show up to church talking about, fill me up, God. Fill me. Ooh, that took too long. This service was too long. I got to get home. I can't watch that stream. Y'all talking to. Go out here in the desert if you want to. There go your 2022. And you out here. I just feel like God is a dry. So you haven't poured. It, and then yeah. ah, whatever you fill up is what you drink from and what you pour out on other people so the reason you have to evaluate which one you're filling is because there is no way you can go into the desert there is no way, let me be clear, you can go into that job. There's no way you can go into this year. There's no way you can steward the influence God's given you. There's no way you can say no when they text you and say you up. There's no way that you can do it and this be your only source. There, you just, you, it's not, you are a human and you get thirsty sometimes. And the reason it's so important as we step into this year that we stop and pray and fast is because it changes things. Here's what you need to do. I'm going to give you three things of how to win the war, then we're going to be out of here. The first thing you have to do is you have to starve your flesh with fasting. You have to starve your flesh. Your flesh is your human appetite and desire for pleasure. Just whatever makes you feel good, whatever you like, whatever you want to do, that is what you have to do. So what you have to do is when you fast... It starves your flesh. It empties the cup that you would naturally drink from. It empties those desires that push you to do the things you don't want to do. It pushes you away from doing things just to fill you that void that you can't fill up with sex. It empties that desire. It gets you uh, free from pornography. It has you put down the bottle. It has you get this empties your flesh. Fasting starves your flesh but here's why you can't just fast at the beginning of the year and never do it again because when you're driving down the street listening to that song when you are with your friends and you go to see that movie and there's that one scene that you close your eyes for but you still hear what's going on when you hang around your family and they're talking about boy if I was you I'd be out here in these streets every single day the world is built to fill up your flesh. And the problem is we have nothing built into our lives that empties this cup. We have no power. This is the most powerful, powerless generation ever that has no practices, nothing in your life to think, how am I going to empty the flesh? Because if you don't empty it, you are going to drink from it. You're just too human. You're not a bad person. You are just a human and you get thirsty sometimes. We have to starve our flesh with fasting. Fasting empties and drains and starves and kills your flesh. Literally on the way here, I was trying to figure out what this point was going to be. I had it one way, then I had changed it, then I had changed it back. Originally, I was going to say fight your flesh. Because I was like, we just need to fight it. We need to, you know, come. And literally, I'm driving in the car on the way here this morning. And God said, you don't even need to fight with it. Just don't fill it up. Some of y'all out here trying to fight. Like, I just, I, I want to be in a situation, but I just don't look at her. Don't look at her. Don't look at her. Hey, girl, how you doing? You don't need to fight it. Just don't even give yourself nothing to drink from. Don't ever put yourself in a compromising position. Don't allow yourself to do things just a little, li little white lie. Don't even fill it up. You don't need to fight it. Just don't even fill that cup up. Too many of us, we have too much belief in ourselves. You think you can be in a situation, this cup have something in it, and you just not drink it. You just not, I'm good, yeah, no, man. I'm going to the club, but I'm going to represent. I'm going into the streets, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to that party to represent, Pastor Mike. Okay. 
but don't walk up in there with this cup empty talking about you about to represent. This is how many people have went into industries, they've went into music, and they started off as a Christian rapper, they started out as a Christian actress, then they up in some movie sleeping with all these people talking about, you, you just didn't fill this cup up. Be careful where you go when your cup is empty. Because you go, some friends you got, y'all just chill, we just hanging out. No, they are pouring into the thing that has power to kill you. I said it earlier, um, <clears throat> We all had, like, Arlo had that little moment where he had the little lion come out. You ever seen those people that try to domesticate wild animals? You've seen them shows. It's actually very tragic. The show starts off, and it's like, this is Sarah. She has had 18 lion cubs since they were one week old. And the story of Sarah is that when all 18 were grown, they decided they were lions. And so they ate Sarah. It is a tragic story. We don't know how it happened. They were so regular. They were so calm. They were so peaceful. But one day... They realized I'm a lion. Many of us got lust. Little lust, little lion cub. He just always been with me. I've domesticated my lust. It can come with me into marriage. I promise you it won't bite nobody. My character is just a little, it's just a little off. It's not bad, but it can come with me to being the CEO. I promise it won't do nothing. I promise it won't bite you. Chill out. You fine. You got them friends that kind of wild. I was about to say my ghetto friends because people be doing that. But they be having them dogs that look like they ate people. Like before they was here, they was eating a person. And then you walk in like, hey, brother, what's going on? He's like, just chill out. He fine. He ain't going to bite you. Just don't move. Just stop moving like that. You breathing too hard. Why you breathing? I can't breathe. Like he going to eat me if I breathe. That's how some of us be with you just got unforgiveness in your family just lust judgment pride drinking taking pills to go to sleep little little things let me tell you that is still a lion and that thing can still kill you and that 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 lust that pervert those things in your heart when they grow up when this is all you have been drinking from don't be surprised in dark moment when your marriage isn't going well when that old person texts you and you, you go back to do what Galatians 5, I didn't want to do it, but I just, this is all you were drinking from. Fasting starves your flesh. But here's the thing. Um, so you do the fast. Some of you are going to fast for the first time in your life. It's going to be the most powerful time. I'm telling you, you're going to start with us tomorrow. You're going to do Daniel's fast. You may, some of you may do water, some of, whatever you're going to, you're going to fast and it's going to empty this cup. But let me tell you something so clearly. Fasting empties this cup. But the reason we pray and we fast is because without prayer, you doing a diet. Without prayer, you have emptied this cup. But you have not filled up this cup. So fasting starves your flesh. But prayer fills your spirit. When you couple prayer and fasting together, you are starving the thing that can kill you. And you are filling up the very thing that gives you life. This is why we pray and we fast. Fasting is not a diet. Fasting is not a fad. Fasting is not something you do so you can lose weight. Fasting is abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. The reason we fast is because we have to starve our flesh. But the reason we pray while we're fasting is because I have to fill my spirit. I need vision from God. I need him to fill me up. I need him to do something new in my life. I need him to give me wisdom to raise my three children. I need him to speak to me about the future. I'm not just going to starve my flesh. I need to fill my spirit. We can't just do the fast and not be praying. If you step into a fast without praying, you're not getting the benefit of having a filled spirit. But when your spirit is full, you drink from that. This is how you're in a hard situation. You wake up in the morning. You say, you know what? During this prayer and fasting, I'm going to read my word every single day. Not for a set amount of time. I'm not saying I got to do a million chapters, but I'm going to do this every single day. 
Then you walk out of your quiet time with God. And your kids acting wild. Because you emptied this cup. The only option for you to pour onto your children. When you go to respond to them breaking your favorite cup, when you go to respond because they did something, the only thing you got to pour on them, the only option you've left yourself is that I have filled my spirit up so much that what I pour out on other people is love, is joy, is peace, is patience, is long suffering. It's the only option you've given yourself to pour out on other people. The reason we fast is because it starves our flesh. But I pray because I need the spirit of God on the inside of me. I pray because by myself, I don't have the wisdom I need. I pray because by myself, I don't know how to love my wife. I pray because by myself, I don't know how to raise my children. I pray because I need the spirit of God to fuel every decision I make. And I'm telling you, there are some of you that when you start to pray and fast, this is going to change everything. You're going to realize that you have access to power. You have access to something that is changing everything. You have to starve your flesh with fasting. And you fill your spirit with prayer. You fill your spirit with prayer. You fill your spirit knowing that, you know what, this is, this is my only, I'm not going to. And here's the thing. Do not put yourself in a position to think, you know what, I've, because here's what happens. You go through life, and maybe you had a good season, and you poured out, and you were faithful, and you were generous, and you gave in the crazy faith offering, and you made the right decision, and you said no, but your cups are empty. But what you need to know is that everyday life fills this cup. Just regular, the default is to fill this cup. So you have to have regular practices, regular things in your life. This is why when God asked me to randomly do more than a 21 day fast or in the middle of the year fast two days, or there are people who God's going to ask you to fast once a day for, for once a month for all year, because what it's a regular practice of pouring your flesh out. And then when you get in God's presence, you read his word, when you listen to worship, when you decide that I'm going to get in community, when you decide that I'm going to surrender, I'm going to obey God, when you do those things, they fill your spirit. So we have to starve our flesh with fasting. We fill our spirit with prayer. But here's the last one. In Matthew 4, Jesus fights the enemy with the word. This is an integral part to our prayer and fasting. We are not just not eating food because that's what we're supposed to do. We're not just praying because that's what we're supposed to do. At the end of the day, when the enemy comes to tempt you, demons do not bow to your name. They don't have to listen to what you just made up. But the word of God, when you find yourself in a compromising situation, when you find yourself where temptation is being presented to you, when you find yourself in a spot where you feel like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I felt like I fasted. I felt like I've prayed, but I'm still being tempted. Here's the thing. When prayer and fasting, just because you're doing it doesn't mean you don't get tempted. There's still going to be a moment where the enemy comes up to offer you pleasure, to offer you a moment to just eat something. The fast isn't that big of a deal. Or you don't have to pray this morning. You prayed yesterday. Or you don't have to tune in for the 21 days because you You've done it 10 days in a row. Why you have to, you fight the enemy with the word. I don't fight the enemy with my own words. I don't fight the enemy with my own ideas. I don't fight the enemy with willpower. I fight the enemy with the word of God. I don't fight the enemy by trying harder and doing more and just being better and being stronger. You are not strong enough to fight the enemy by yourself. 
You starve your flesh through fasting. You fill your spirit. But then you have to fight the enemy with the word of God. The word of the God is the only thing that can change things. Hebrews 12 says it this way. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing and divising, dividing the soul and the spirit. Of joint and marrow, discerning thoughts and intentions of the heart. Psalms 119 says, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Isaiah 55 says, so my word that goes out of your mouth, it shall not return empty. Psalms 107 says, he sent out his word and he healed them. Matthew 4. When Jesus is in the desert, man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God. We starve our flesh, we fill our spirit, and we fight the enemy with the word of God. As we close, I have to bring um, this final uh, kind of point and really challenge to all of us because, you know, I, I grew up in a, uh, a prayer and fasting home. But I thank God for my parents who set an example. Parents, you, you have no idea the example you are setting for your children. I remember my parents making this nasty soup. Misha, it was so gross. It was, so, it was just like water and a little, like a third of tomato juice. It was like, what is this? Is this just pepper and water? Is that what you're eating? Like, and then they'd be making us eat it. Like just one meal a day, you're gonna eat, this is what you're gonna be on me. I was like, this is not a meal. This is like toilet bowl water that you poured in this big pot. And then, oh, anyways. But mom and dad, I love you so much. <laughs> but even being around it and growing up with it, I still didn't understand the power of it. I still didn't understand the importance of why. Why is it so important that we fast? It's not even that like, why, why is it the, the biggest deal that we have to fast? The scripture says, when you pray, when you give, when you fast. Fasting is not an option. It was a necessity that God said. Fasting is not just something side that you do or my uh, theology doesn't believe in fasting or my group of friends doesn't. You can be not believe it if you want to, but there is power in fasting. How do I know? Because it was the power of food that ruined the Garden of Eden. Food. We downplay it. It's not that big of a deal what you eat. It's not that big a deal to do fasting. Really? Because the thing that introduced sin into the world was God said, don't eat something and man couldn't do it. We couldn't, without, without, with no matter all the power, being in the garden, doing all the things, it was not anything else but food that introduced sin into the world. Wow. So I know you may have never fasted before, but I want you to know what you eat is more powerful than you think. It is connecting to something deeper. God said, of all the trees, there's all these trees, you can eat any one you want to, just don't eat that one. Wow. And the lack, and the inability... For man to deny his flesh introduced a curse into the world that would ravage humanity forever. And we say things like, fasting isn't that important. You don't have to do, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. I'll just do like, and here's the thing, fasting, um, and I, I want to say this with all grace and love, um, there's, it's very common right now to hear people talking about, and me, I've done this, do this, to say I'm fasting social media, I'm fasting TV, I'm fat. All of those things are amazing. If you've never fasted before and you're trying to step into it, I think those are helpful. But I want to be very clear. To, the word fast, like when it, biblical language, theology, the, the actual etymology of the word is to cover your mouth. It is to not eat food. So I want to challenge some of you who you've been following Jesus your whole life and every so often you say I'm on a fast, but really you're just not on Instagram all day. That, does, that is good. You should do that. 
But I want you to know, there is something powerful when you deny your flesh the very things it thinks it needs to live. Jesus said it, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from God. I am telling you, there is a power that happens when you say, I know it feels like I'm hungry. I know I feel, but every time I'm hungry, I'm going to feed on the word of God. Every time I feel like I want to eat something, I'm going to pray for my neighbor. Every time I feel like I want to just cheat on this thing, I'm going to say, God, expose something in me because if God can get a hold of your flesh and cancel that thing you will be filled with the same power that got Christ up out of the grave why don't we see miracles why don't we see people coming back to life could it be that the same spirit doesn't live in you you're living off of a different cup but today I'm believing by the power of God you're gonna make a decision to fill your spirit with the word of God to know that you do have a purpose to know that you can't say no that you can't stop that addiction that you can be secure in your singleness you are going to fill your spirit and walk in the power of God we will not be a powerless church we will not feed our flesh and then wonder why people aren't being saved we will starve our flesh till that thing dies and we will see the world transformed by a church who knows that God is my source he is my power all I have comes from him we will not be a powerless church We're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. And if you are a part of this church, I am challenging you to tell your flesh to shut up. Be quiet. I don't want to hear it. I know I have some pain, but I'm not going to fill it with sex. I know I have some insecurities, but I'm not going to fill it with Instagram. I'm going to fill it with the only answer, and that is Jesus. Galatians 5 is so powerful. He says, what I'm doing, I can't, I don't want to do it anymore. Who can help me? I am a miserable person. But then Paul says, but thanks be to God, who because of him, he came and he made a way. He made a way for you to win the war within. You don't have to fight by yourself. You don't have to fight with willpower. You don't have to fight with six steps. You don't have to fight with just thinking that I can just try harder and do more. You have access to a power that has power over death, hell, and the grave. You have access to a power that spoke stars into existence. You have access to the same power that saved humanity. And all I'm asking you today Over the next couple days as we step into this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Here's what I'm going to ask you. I'm not just going to ask you to empty your flesh. Or fill your spirit or fight the what. I'm going to ask you. Don't stop pouring. Because some of you. You got to a point where it seemed good enough. And you just stopped. You thought, man, I've, I've, I've read the Bible enough. I don't need to. It's just. But what you don't understand is that there are other vessels that are around your life that need you to pour onto them. And they need an answer and they need solutions. And when you stop pouring You don't realize that it stops flowing. And so there are other people, there are other, there are other family members that need you to keep pouring because they're going to happen to just be around you when you, when you deny that thing. They're going to see the way you're raising your children. They're going to see the way you're running your business. And they're going to see that you are pouring and pouring and the overflow of your life is going to be the ministry. I'm believing that you ain't even going to have to tell people you got God, but they're going to see the pour of your life and it will overflow onto people around the world. That's going to be the testimony of Transformation Church that the overflow healed people that the overflow restored marriages that the come on y'all that's going to be the man that the overflow transformed lives that the overflow restored this city that the overflow canceled racism that the overflow brought finances to depraved places that the overflow made a difference i'm not just trying to live off a little bit i'm just trying to live off a sip i'm trying to pour out on my children i'm trying to pour out on my family i'm trying to pour out so God can fill me back up again. 
I am believing with everything within me. This is going to be the most powerful year of your life if you get access to the true power you need. Some of you feel so defeated in this war. You feel so uh, uh, overbearing and overtaken by this war. That is because you have not realized that you have access to a power that is greater than you. You can't fight anxiety on your own. You can't fight that addiction on your own. Your marriage isn't going to make it just by you trying harder. You need access to something greater than you. Can I tell you, it's not just a feeling. It's not just an idea. It's not just water. It is the Savior of the universe. It is Jesus Christ, the living God. I'm not going to live just some regular life where I just keep things. This is the thing. We, our church is called Transformation Church. Yeah. What does that mean? Every time I get around this thing, I should be changing. Wow. It's so interesting to me that you can say you fast. You've been fasting and praying 20 years, but you still mean or you still don't obey. How is that possible? Because there's still something feeding the flesh. It, and here's the thing, and I, woo, all this is coming to me right now. I need more water. What happens is many of us, um, Will, come up here. Will, come up here. Here's what happens. I need you to pour this into this when I say so. Many of us, we're doing this. What we don't realize is there are other relationships that at the exact same time you're doing this, that movie is pouring in the same time. Oh my God. You don't realize that there are things that, and so how bad is it that when you run out, wow. Wow. Woo. You, you didn't cut off the supply that kept pouring into, and now here's the thing. Thank you so much, Will. Many of us, what's bad is when you're in a situation when they both look full. Why you have to keep fasting is because you'll get in a moment where it's like, well, I don't know. They both look the same. Wow. They both well, maybe. Ah, I don't know. Is this do I need to rely on my own strength to, to do this? This is a good business idea and it would make me money. And it would, I mean, I could it would maybe work out to fund the camp. Maybe it looks is that the, I think it's the same thing. Let me just. Yeah, that is the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, influence and purpose are the same. Yeah, people applauding and, and, and being anointed is the same. Yeah, if people are cheering for me, that's mean I'm obeying God. Okay, bet. Great. Let's do what God has called us to do. Because they look, they look, they look the same and you left, you left yourself options. But I've just decided, I... I I can't handle options. And I know it's going to take some humility for some of you to say that. But you can't. I can't handle options. I'm just not. I'm not there yet. And I don't know if I ever will be. I just, I got to make a decision that, um. I'm just, I'm only going to, here's the crazy thing. What I love is there's a certain poor that, um, one second. There's a certain point where you get in your life where God says, I want to do something new in you. You've emptied this cup. But God says, I want to pour. Scripture talks about new wine. God says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not see it? What happens is there's an oil that God wants to pour. And the thing about this oil is when you understand the anointing that's on your life, when you understand that there are things that God's asked you to do that no one else can do, when you understand and you stand securely in your calling, when you allow God to fill you up with his oil, when you allow his spirit to be the thing that fuels everything in you, when you allow yourself to submit yourself to counsel, to submit yourself to counseling, to say, I'm sorry, when you allow God to fill up your spirit...
And then flesh comes along. Eventually, this cup, you don't see it anymore because you've developed such a spirit. But even when something tries to come, what you don't know is oil and water don't mix. And so what happens is it becomes obvious over time to separate God from good ideas. It becomes obvious in you to say, you know what, I can see that the motive of why I did that thing. Maybe I, I'm, I've been flowing out of this right place, but there's a motive that was off. And God, if there's anything off in me, I want you to be able to say right there, when you posted that thing, when you didn't apologize, when you, say, you didn't go to your children and say, mommy and daddy are going to start going to counseling and you're going to stay with grandma for a while because we're not perfect. When you, God says, I want to be in your life in such a way that it's obvious when it wasn't me. I don't want to be on the line of Christianity. I don't want to be trying to figure out, is this a sin? Is that a sin? Can I sleep with them? Can I not? Could I look at porn? Could I masturbate if we hadn't had sex in a while? Could I? Could I? Could I? Could I? No, I'm trying for God to say whatever you need to call out in me. If there's a motive, if I look for just a second, if I did anything outside of your plan, God, expose it right now. I don't want to live no weak baby Christian life. I just, it's, it's, let me say this. The fruit of it is not fulfilling. It's just not, it's not enough for me to leave my family. It's not enough for me to raise my kid. It's just, it's, I need something more. And many of you, the worship team and band could come back up. Many of you, um, that's what life has felt like. It's felt like you, you've kept taking drinks and it just felt like it didn't, it didn't really do it for you. It felt like the amount of money, no amount of sex, no, it couldn't fill you up. It felt like you couldn't win the war, that you just, you, you tried everything. You, you tried money, you've tried, you've, but you find yourself in a place where it feels like I don't know if I can win. Today, I'm coming to you saying that there is beautiful hope in the name of Jesus. You don't have to fight by yourself. You don't have to try to, to do good things or try to live up to this uh, unreasonable standard. This is not uh, religion. Religion tells you. That if you do good things, if you're a good person, if you make sure you pray this many times a day, or if you pray loud, or if you say God's name in a certain way. There's the thing about prayer. I have to get this out. The goal of prayer and prayer, I'm going to say this. It's not only, prayer is not only talking to God. If prayer is just what you're saying out of your mouth, how do you pray without ceasing and lead the meeting? Here's my beef with prayer is talking to God. My only beef is how do I correct my child and be praying at the same time if it's only talking to God? Prayer, it includes talking to God. But prayer is simply communing with God. There's a difference. Me and my wife, there are times where if I need to know something, I can talk to her. But there are other times just by being in her presence. I know what she wants to do. I can tell that I can tell that wasn't pleasing to your heart just by the way you responded. You didn't have to say anything. You didn't have to tell anything. What could happen if your maturity with Jesus, you know, the immaturity of a relationship is exposed when you don't know what to say. Like I got friends that just start dating people. And it's like, I don't know what to say. I just feel like we got to talk about stuff. You get to a certain point where me and Abby can just sit quiet for hours. Because the goal is not, I always got to be saying something, asking you for something. Could you do this for me? Could you help? Prayer is powerful. You can add, bring all your requests known to God. Literally, don't pray about anything instead, uh, or don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Let your requests be known to God. And guess what it says? It doesn't say he'll give you the request. Wow. It says, then you will experience peace. Prayer is not a wish list that we say, God, I'm going to talk loud. You're going to give me everything I want. He says, you talk to me and I'll give you peace. 
You'll talk to me and you'll find contentment. You'll talk to me and I'll say it's okay to say I'm sorry. You'll talk to me and I will change something on the inside of you. My prayer today is that no longer would we drink from the flesh. No longer would we settle for this facade of freedom that the world tries to sell. That is, I can do and say whatever I want. No, may we, you know something, language that doesn't even compute yet in my mind. James, the brother of Jesus, which is just trippy. Like, I got a brother. He ain't Jesus. And it would be weird to try to convince me that he was. But James says his language, he says, oh, James, out of anything he could have used to describe himself, I would have been like, Jesus, brother, just in case y'all was wondering. He says, a slave to Jesus Christ. What happens when your life is positioned to say, God, I am completely surrendered to whatever you want to do. All around the world, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Um, as we talk about stepping into um, 21 days of prayer and fasting, we start tomorrow. We're going to be going live every single day um, at night, but out of a moment, I just want you to focus in on maybe where you are. Maybe you find yourself in a place today where um, you start to look at the fruit of your life. You start to look at maybe where your dependence has been, maybe where um, you've perceived a uh, your life to be from or where you resonate with. You're just starting to look at your life and you're realizing, man, man, there are some areas where I've been, I've been, I've been operating out of the sin nature. I've just, I've let that thing fuel me. I've let it be the thing. And honestly, it's been the thing that's filled me up. My flesh is just, I don't know how to stop filling up my flesh. What happens? And many of you, there's this, there's this question of what happens if I don't fill it up? What happens if I don't have sex anymore? What happens if I don't smoke that anymore? Will I really ever find peace? Will I ever find security? This has kind of worked for me for the last season. This is kind of, I've maybe kind of found value in being the know-it-all. I've kind of found value in how many degrees I've had. I've kind of found value in being able to make everybody laugh. What happens if, 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 if the thing that I was connected to is is not the real thing today God is presenting you a choice he says instead of you trying to fill yourself up let me fill you up there's so many different types of prayer and I wish I could go into all of it but I'm preaching too long but there's these early uh, church mothers and fathers the desert fathers and mothers these are the original people this is where um, monks came from and I know a lot of people uh, growing up I didn't know I wasn't educated in church history so any type of other person I thought they was not a Christian they didn't love Jesus but monks actually did a ton of stuff in the faith there was actually one monk that went out to the desert for 20 years and then he came out his name was Athanasia and he's the one that developed and got the Holy Spirit trusted him with the revelation that God is a trinity. He's three in one. We, it wasn't just a thing that was predetermined. Like 385 after Christ had door, uh, died, he literally went into the desert. Monks, what they would do is they saw Matthew 4 as a picture of their life. So they would physically go into the desert to resort not from the people, but for the sake of the people. And then after 20 years, early on in the church history, you had to be a monk for 20 to 50 to 25 years before you could ever be a pastor because the desert killed your flesh and they knew that you could have a pure motive. What you were giving to the people had been developed in the desert. And one of the types of prayers that will happen in monasteries is contemplative prayer. It's not all yelling. It's not screaming. It's quiet. They do things called breath prayers. This is stuff you get in this house because I love to shout. I love to sing. I love to get loud. Go to the symbols, Tony. Let's send it there. But sometimes... One I've been doing recently, all you do is there's two phrases. As you breathe in, you think this. As you breathe out, you think. One that I've been doing is, God is my source. My peace comes from him. So I'm walking through the day, and here's how you pray without ceasing. Arlo, freaking out. Hey, buddy.
just, I'm, I'm just, there's a burden on my heart for us to mature past transactional religion. God is not a, a cashier at Save-A-Lot where you can just come in and, and get cheap stuff for a couple dollars and you can pray once and he'll give you something nice. This is a relationship with God and there are different ways to engage with him. So if you're loud, be loud. If you're quiet, be quiet. If you can sing, sing. If you just want to journal for the rest of your life, do it. But the goal is to commune with God and allow him to fill you up. God, right now we are praying, we are begging that you would fill us up. We are saying, God, we have tried to fill ourselves up. We've tried money. We've tried people and relationships. We've tried being the business owner. We've tried it all. And there is nothing that can fill us up, Lord God. But your spirit is the only thing that brings real life. Your spirit is the only thing that satisfies my soul. Your spirit... It's the only thing. God, right now, our prayer, we're asking, would you fill us up? Yeah, seeing that God, God, just in this moment, right here, wherever you are, in your homes, in your cars, some of you need to pull over, just, just right now, you've, you're pouring out your cup. You're saying, God, I don't want it, but would you fill me up with your joy, with your love? God, fill me up. Come on, just a moment. We're going to worship for just a moment. Come on, sing that out. Come on, God, we want all of you. All of you. Less of us and more of you. That is our prayer. Less of me, more of you. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill me up, God. Fill up homes. Fill up marriages. Fill up minds, Lord God. Fill up children. God, fill me up. God, fill me up. God, fill me up. God, fill me up up till I overflow. Fill me up. God, fill me up, God. with joy. Fill us up with love. Fill us up with faithfulness. Fill us up with chillness. Fill us up with self-control. God, fill me up. Yes, yes, thank you, God. That's our prayer. Fill me up, God. Yes. Until I overflow, I want to Yeah, I don't want just enough for today. I don't want just enough to get through this moment. God, I want to overflow, Lord Jesus. God, I want more than enough, Lord God. I want everything you have for me, God. I want to run over. I want my love to overflow. I want peace to overflow. I want a joy on the inside of me that overflows onto every person that I come into contact with. Lord God, right now, fill us up. I thank you. I'm thanking you right now. You've already done it. There are people right now who have felt empty. They felt like they didn't have anything, but I'm telling you to check again. Go back to that vessel. Some of you thought you didn't have peace. Check again. Some of you thought you didn't have joy. Check again. Some of you thought you didn't have contentment. Check again. God is filling up his children right now. I feel that thing all over the world. People who have struggled, people who felt empty, who, people who feel like they didn't have enough. We serve a God of more than enough. And as long as you have somewhere for him to pour, as long as you 
are an open and willing vessel. God says, I'll keep on pouring on your marriage. This isn't the best it's ever been. I've got more for you. I'll keep on pouring on that business. This isn't all I want to do. I'll keep pouring on that church. That isn't all I want to do. God, fill us up. Right now, there are people in this, there are people watching right now that you talk about your status. We talked about, again, the sin nature and the spirit nature. They both had a position. One was separated, one is submitted. Some of you feel like you've been trying to fight this war by yourself. Can I tell you, you don't have to do it. In a moment of surrender, you can accept Jesus Christ into your life, and it'll be the best decision you have ever made. You don't have to stop doing bad things, but in a moment of surrender, when you give your life to him, you enter into a beautiful, amazing relationship with Jesus all you have to do is on the count of three I'm gonna count and on the count of three I want you to raise your hand all you're doing is you're acknowledging on the outside what God is doing on the inside some of you this is the change that will change everything for your family you're gonna make this decision and then tomorrow you're gonna join us for prayer and fasting and your family name will never be the same legacies are changing today generations are changing today if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior it's the good news it's the gospel the good news is we were separated from God but because Jesus came into this earth he lived a sinless and perfect life he died on a cross for you and for me and in one moment you can have relationship with him one two he loves you he's so proud of you three lift your hand right now all over the world come on people are accepting Jesus that's you I come on God sees you he's proud of you oh come on people are accepting Jesus listen here's what I'm gonna do if you just raise your hand no matter where you are I want you to pray this prayer with me as a church family hundreds of thousands of people around the world are gonna pray this prayer for you whether you're watching this today or maybe you're watching this 20 years from now this is a moment between you and God and God sees you and this is change y'all everything is changing right now I feel God thank you that you're changing generations you're changing stories people who were headed one way you're turning them and redirecting them y'all I feel marriages that were on the edge of divorce God you thank you God Lord people who are going to commit suicide you're ripping them out right now Lord Jesus you are changing directions I'm telling you some of you you are on a trajectory you are on a path but God says today I'm turning you I've got a plan and a purpose for your life a plan to prosper you not to harm you I'm telling you Lord I thank you that you're changing paths right now God you are re directing steps the steps of the righteous man the steps of a righteous woman they are ordered by God God I thank you that you are reordering steps you are making a way when there seems to be no way thank you God thank you God thank you God finished 
It is finished. That's what's in my spirit right now. God said it on the cross. It is finished. You know what he was saying was finished? The war. The war that you're in right now, God declared over your life. 2,000, over thousands of years, he said, it is finished. No matter if it feels like it's not finished yet, some of you feel like you're still in the thick of it, like you don't know. God came to tell you today, it's done. It is done. Now, just don't give up. That's the encouragement. Don't lose heart. Don't quit. The battle's already won. If you just last to the end, I promise the king is on the throne. The battle's already been won. Don't give up. You just prayed that prayer. If you just accepted Jesus, we want to pray with you. Everybody in the room, everybody around the world, repeat after me. Say, dear God, I love you. Thank you for laying down your life to save mine. I admit I've made mistakes. Jesus, save me. Change me. Transform me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, listen, if you just made that decision, we are so, so proud of you. We're so proud of you. God is so proud of you. He's so proud of you. He loves you so, so much. Here's what we want to do. As a church, we'd love to support you. We'd love to support you. We'd love the opportunity to come alongside of you and just... Um, give you the space to grow. This is not about perfection. This is about progression. This is about allowing God to grow you into a beautiful person um, that you don't even recognize. Like, you won't even recognize who you really are once you surrender yourself to God. If you text SAVED to 828282, our team would love to send you some resources. We're just going to give you some things to support you, to encourage you on this journey of following Jesus. While you're doing that, some of you, um, I think you can text 21. Is that right? To join us, tw text 21 to 828282. Some of you, tomorrow. Don't let a day go by. Tomorrow, join us on this fast. I'm telling you, this will be your best year if it is your best year spiritually. And the best way to do that is to starve your flesh with fasting. Fill your spirit with prayer. And we're going to fight the enemy uh, with the word of God. Listen, we have resources. You can go to our app. You can, if you've never fasted before, some of you need to go through and read. You can do the Daniel's fast. Some of you, um, just what we have resources to support you. All I'm saying, don't let a moment go by without an opportunity for God to fill you up. Listen, as a church, um, on behalf of our incredible lead pastors, Pastor Michael and Natalie, I want you to know we love you. We pray for you. We are here for you. And I'm believing um, that God, this year, God wants to do something amazing through your life. Thank you for tuning in with us today. Thank you for being generous and giving. And, um, and I'm so grateful to be a part of a church uh, that understands that God is our source. Now, listen, we love you. We're so grateful for you. Go out and live a transformed life. We'll see you guys. Soon.